So I will get started. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Wen. I'm a senior research transportation engineer at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Um, so for uh, those of you who don't know Insurance Institute for Highway Safety or IHS uh, very well, so we are a um, um, independent nonprofit research organization. So we aim to uh, reduce death, injuries, and property damages from motor vehicle crashes through research and uh, education. So uh, we all know that speeding is dangerous. Higher speeds increase the risk uh, of a crash as well as the risk of severe injuries in crashes. Um, over the past decade, speeding has been a factor in more than a quarter of deaths. And the pandemic just made speeding even worse than it already were, was. Um, in 2020, um, more than 11,000 fatalities occurred in the speeding related crashes. That was a 17% jump from the previous year. So as the zero world fatalities became a national goal, every element of the transportation system needs to work together to achieve a safe system. And then within a safe system, within the um, five elements, safe speeds is a central part, it's a central element. So with that being said, um, addressing speeding is very challenging, uh, as we all know. Um, various national services have documented inconsistencies between the driver's perception of speeding and uh, the driver's speeding behavior. And these inconsistencies created challenges to addressing the issue of speeding. For example, a 2020 national survey by the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety um, found that a large majority of the drivers understood that it was very dangerous to um, travel to travel um, 50 miles per hour over the speed limit on freeways or 10 miles per hour over the speed limit on residential streets. But still a considerable proportion of them admitted doing so during the past um, 30 days. And uh, back in 2019, IHS and the Governor's Highway Safety Association hosted a national um, speed forum um, in this forum, a diverse group of stakeholders from engineering, enforcement, advocacy, uh, policy, and uh, communication join a discussion to um, discuss ways to um, how to manage effectively the problem of speeding. Um, and then following the speed forum, IHS, the Governor's Highway Safety Association, and the National Road Safety Foundation uh, founded two speed management management pilot programs, one in uh, rural areas in Maryland and the other one in an urban area in Virginia. So each state received 100,000 um, in funding for program development. So both of these uh, programs are comprehensive and combine components um, from engineering, enforcement and public outreach. So the goal of this joint effort is to um, develop a template for effective street um, speed management strategies that can be used in other states and communities. And then the rest of the, my presentation is gonna talk about uh, the program in Maryland. So this program took place in the summer of 2021. Um, the road segment selected for the program um, was located in Bishopville, Maryland. So it's uh, in a uh, rural area of the state of Maryland. It's located on the Eastern shore. The, the road segment selected for the program uh, was a uh, rural touring undivided road. Um, it's a popular route for beach traffic in the summer and speeding had been a known problem on this road. So this video shows some uh, elements of this program. So the engineering treatment of the program included uh, widen, uh, narrowing the travel lanes along the entire corridor by uh, widening the lane line markings. 
and speed feedback signs installed at two locations along the corridor. And four high visibility enforcement waves um, through August. And there were also public outreach efforts to educate the community of the program and to encourage drivers to slow down. Here in the video, you can see these uh, road signs installed along the uh, corridor. And they also put up information on a billboard um, at the entrance to the road segment. And there was also a um, public information campaign in a company with the um, high visibility enforcement waves in August. And the campaign message was distributed on uh, multiple social media uh, platforms on these ads, as well as in a weekly um, print local publication. Um, so we evaluated um, the public awareness of this program. So to do that, we did a survey before and after the program started. And in the survey, we asked um, the local drivers whether they were aware of some of the program elements, including the widened center and edge lines, the speed feedback signs, um, the high visibility police enforcement efforts, and uh, the, the campaign message. And uh, we found that the awareness of these program elements increased substantially after the program started. So also, uh, we found that through the survey that after um, the program started, the proportion of the survey respondents who thought speeding was a major pro uh, problem on that road segment substantially declined. And uh, the percentage of um, these um, respondents who thought um, the, those drivers who uh, were speeding would be very likely to be stopped by police increased substantially after the program started. The second part of the evaluation is to uh, evaluate the effect of, uh, of the program on speeds and the speeding behavior. So to do that, we collected uh, speed data before the program started, during the program, and after the program ended. Um, by analyzing the speed data, we found that, so during the program, there was a 9% reduction in the mean speed, a 78% reduction in the odds of um, exceeding the speed limit by any, any amount, and a 80% reduction in the odds of exceeding the speed limit by more than 10 miles per hour. And then after the program ended, we still saw um, that the mean speed and the odds of exceeding the speed limit were lower than what would have been expected without the, uh, the pilot program. But um, the odds of exceeding the speed limit by more than 10 miles per hour um, were higher than expected. So based on the, uh, the study findings, um, it's pretty clear that the program was very effective in reducing speeds and the speeding behavior. And then after the program ended, um, program effect may have persisted for the average drivers who tend to speed by small, small amount, but not for those uh, drivers who speed more aggressively. One thing to point out is that after the program ended, the entire road segment was repaved um, and we'll know that drivers tend to travel faster on rapid pavement. But after seeing the safety effects, the Maryland DOT uh, restored um, the widened um, lane line markings. So the other point to make is that um, like this, the effect of the speed management program should be sustainable in the long run. So there are ways to make this happen, such as to use speed cameras, which enforce the speed limits 24-7 and uh, permanent engineering treatments, and also uh, periodical repeated enforcement and uh, communication countermeasures. So the next um, steps, regarding the next steps of our efforts, we're um, the second uh, funded program in Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, is still uh, 
under planning. And after um, the program started, we'll repeat a similar evaluation to see evaluate the effects. And then in this program, there will be uh, speed cameras in the school zones. There will be a media campaign and some engineering um, treatment. So that's all I have for today. Um, happy to discuss um, if there's any questions, suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Wen. Uh, I remember being at that 2019 meeting, and it was really great to, uh, to be there with so many people interested in slowing down speeds. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I always remember is that there were four types of speeders discussed, uh, one of which is kind of the habitual speeder, um, which kind of to me feels like that, that percentage of speeders who like kept speeding over 10 miles per hour after that right. intervention mm -hmm. ended. <laughs> Um, yes. Um, so, so yeah, uh, there are ways. Uh, I'm gonna make Eric <laughs> okay. a post now, hopefully. So, I think I have to reclaim it. Um, and we'll we'll have hopefully some time for questions at the end. So, uh, people, be active in the chat. Eric is hopefully a host now. Um, and can share his screen, um, and then we'll we'll go to Rod after Eric. We can see your screen, Eric. Great, fabulous. So, thank you for letting us present today at the National Bike Summit on behalf of our mayor, our DCAS commissioner, and our chief lead officer Keith Kerman. I'm Eric Richardson. I'm the deputy chief lead officer for the city of New York. And I'll talk to you a little bit today about some of the work that we're doing to make our vehicles safer, to improve traffic safety, and also to protect road users. As many of you know, the New York City fleet is made up of about 25,000 on-road vehicles, about 5,000 off-road vehicles, and it includes the New York City Police Department, the Department of Sanitation, the Fire Department, Parks Department, and many other agencies who operate all the critical services that the city provides. We have an executive order 53 that looks at our fleet and that calls for safe fleet transition plans that govern the outfitting of vehicles in order to make them as safe as possible. We are required to a safe fleet transition plan almost every year um, and we've done four so far. We've done our original truck side guard transition plan, our original safe fleet transition plan, an update, and then we did a private waste hauler safe fleet transition plan. We are currently working on a safe fleet transition plan for the New York City school buses, which should be released sometime in April of this year. What is the safe fleet transition plan? Well, the safe fleet transition plan simply is a list of technologies and improvements to vehicles that we believe we need to put on in order to make vehicles safer. These include transitioning to high vision truck cabs, front collision warning systems, automatic braking, truck side guards, et cetera. Now we have what's called tier one. Tier one is required technologies on all new vehicles. And tier two is best practices, things that we are trying out Tier three are exploratory, things that perhaps were not necessarily ready for a prime time the last time we did this report. Now, in some cases, we are doing retrofits with some of these technologies, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the technologies that we're putting into our vehicles now. Just as an FYI, since 2017, over 72,000 vehicles have had some sort of safety systems put in, um, 72,000 improvements across all of the vehicles. Um, this is just a nice graphic of what our fleet office of real-time tracking looks at every day. Every single city vehicle has telematics installed. The New York City Police Department has their own system. However, this is just a visual representation of a snapshot in time of where our city vehicles were that are being tracked. Part of our way is that we are able to reduce speeding and to go after driver behaviors that are dangerous are real-time safety alerts. Over 1,000 people in the city of New York get real-time safety alerts on the vehicles that are being under their purview. 
So it's Parks Department, DEP, sanitation. If you're not driving safely, your supervisor will get an immediate alert based on certain factors, including excessive speeding. As you can see, part of our telematics portfolio through aggressive alerting of supervisors and through working with agencies, we've been able to drive excessive speeding alerts down over the last four years. Obviously, you could see a little bit of a tick up in the last three months, and we are working on trying to resolve that. Um, obviously, we also had a huge spike in excessive speeding events during the COVID-19 pandemic. I know everybody understands that we saw that behaviors not only with city fleet vehicles, but also in general. We'd send out vehicle safety scorecards on a monthly basis to all agency commissioners. So every month, an agency commissioner will get a list of vehicles what their score was based on different weightings and different factors, and whether or not these vehicles are considered to be low, mild, medium, or high risk. We focus on the high risk and the medium risk vehicles and what it was that created those exceptions. Um, as you can see, one of the issues is seatbelt notifications. This is not necessarily a number of trips. This is the number of times that the seatbelt alert alerted that the person wasn't wearing their seatbelt. Regardless, that is not a behavior we want to see. And obviously, whenever people are speeding, we want to drive that down. We also know that the safest vehicle is no vehicle at all. So we are using telematics to reduce our city's fleet. And we will soon announce that we completed this process of reducing the city's fleet by more than 855 vehicles. This is one of the more exciting pilots that we are now working on. Um, and that I, you can see my background is on this, this pilot. It's intelligent speed assist. It's actually a system in every vehicle. Um, and we started out with 50 city vehicles as a pilot that will prevent vehicles from speeding in the first place. So we are able to now know that based on the pilot vehicles that we've done, over 150,000 miles of driving 99% of the time, the vehicles drove within the speed limit that we set. We also are finding a significant reduction in harsh braking. And we will continue this pilot through the end of next month, partnering with the US DOT Velpe Center on a pilot assessment report. And then we will be expanding it over the next few months to 250 vehicles, including collection trucks, buses, and construction trucks. We are also now applying for a grant under the Safe Streets for All program to install ISA in all light and medium non-emergency vehicles over the next three years. This will be a total of 7,500 vehicles to start with. The other thing that we've done in the city's fleet is we've changed a lot of our truck vehicle design. One of the things that we have in the city's fleet is truck side guards. Now, the one thing that I want to let everybody know about truck side guards in an urban environment is these are more like what's called lateral protection devices. And these prevent pedestrians and bicyclists from sliding under in between the front and rear wheel. The difference between our urban environment and the federal law that's being proposed for overhaul trucks is that ours simply do not stop a vehicle going at an excessive speed. Ours are meant for the urban environment for bicyclists and pedestrians. However, we fully support the law that's being proposed to put side guards on all trailers at a certain weight capacity in order to prevent vehicles from sliding on them as well. And in our side guard program, we've proved you could do side guards on almost any type of truck. We currently have almost all of our eligible trucks installed with side guards, except for some at the Department of Sanitation, which are being phased out over the next year. We also put in place recently, Local Law 108 will require truck side guards for any contractor that does business with the city of New York where they use a truck for regular business. Our next item that we're working on is we're changing vehicle truck design for high vision trucks. We know based on studies that the US DOT Volpe Center has done that low vision trucks versus high vision trucks, there's no comparison in a simulation to the number of people who unfortunately would get killed in that simulation study with a high vision truck versus a low vision truck. But what do we do in the meantime? How do we handle the transition period in which we are trying to get 
two high vision trucks, a number of technology projects. So we're doing surround cameras in all of our city fleet trucks. We're doing a turn al alerting for pedestrians and cyclists to be able to hear when a truck is turning. <laughs> And we are doing some innovative technology with Together for Safer Roads and Vision Track, including AI cameras and DVRs, in order to be able to do some predictive behaviors on pedestrian alerting and then also make sure that we can track to see about our near misses with vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and bicyclists. I do encourage you to come to a couple of events. For those of you who enjoy walking and enjoy riding your bike, New York City Car Free Day is on April 22nd with Earth Day. And we have our New York City Annual Equipment and Vehicles Show on May 11th. We will have a number of vehicles and technologies in order to be set up to make roads safer. And then my information is here. Anybody who wants to reach out, feel free to email me. And that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. That was great. Um, the league is really excited to work with America Walks and the Vision Zero Network and a few other partners on a Safer Fleets Challenge that we're launching next month, um, encouraging every city to have safer fleets like New York City is doing and really making that a priority uh, for any public agency that has fleets. They should be making sure that their fleet vehicles are equipped with things like speed limiters, side guards, and other things that make everyone safer. Um, so thank you for that leadership, Eric, and for sharing that with us today. Um, now, hopefully I can make Rod a host. Yep, we're playing again. Um, yep, so. My uh, screen sharing is disabled, Ken. Yeah, I'm trying to reclaim the hosting from Eric. Bottom, bottom of your screen, bottom right, bottom, bottom, bottom right, keep going. Oh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work. Um, <laughs> All right, I think we got you, Rod. Um, can you share your screen now? Yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> excellent. Right, you can see the screen now. We can see it. Good, excellent. And you can hear me. So that's uh, that's another uh, good thing. Well, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and uh, let me uh, say that, uh, yeah, I'm the founder and campaign director for 20s Plenty for Us, or Love 30 as we call it in those countries, which actually use modern units of uh, 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 of measurement. So uh, there we are, 20 plenty for us, love, love 30. Um, look, I, I guess I used to be a cycle campaigner. Um, that was uh, some time ago, um, but um, I'm all right now. Let me tell you a little bit about that, 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 that journey. Uh, and perhaps along that way, we can we look and look at the ways in which you actually can do something uh, in, in order to uh, change the speed of vehicles uh, on on our roads. And and one of the perhaps the best things which we can do is to recognise that most urban speed limits are too high to safely accommodate uh, active travel. And for that reason, they're never going to be compatible. Uh, with Vision uh, Zero. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, we've arrived at that, what we do, and really just throw in some examples of the way we go uh, about things. So yeah, nearly 20 years ago, this is me after cycling to our twin town, uh, which is Hilden in Germany. I, I cycled from Warrington in Northwest uh, uh, England, and I'd heard there that 25% of their in-town trips were by bicycle. So I wanted to find out what fantastic cycling infrastructure they had. Um, and when I got there, I found they didn't have any. But in 1991, they set a 30 kilometer speed limit across the whole city. And 
Uh, they also said that any one-way streets uh, were going to be two-way for cyclists because they had a low speed limit of 30 kilometers per hour or 18 and a half uh, miles per hour. So I came back and started campaigning in my, my local town for, for that. Uh, a few people got to hear about it. I sort of became a little bit of an expert on it. And in order to help other places which wanted lower speeds as well, I set up 20s plenty for us in 2007. A few little milestones on the way. 2010, I was invited by Transportation Alternatives uh, to speak in New York City at a uh, speed summit, which they were um, uh, holding. Incidentally, I did do a walk around there with uh, Senator Eric Adams um, uh, and talking about 20 mile an hour uh, speed limits. So I was there <laughs> right, uh, some quite a few years ago. Really delighted for all the work which we've been doing to receive an MBE uh, award from the Queen in 2013. That opened a lot of doors uh, because this was establishment recognition, if you like, that 20 mile an hour as a speed limit for uh, towns uh, and cities uh, was in, in, important. Uh, and that recognition opened doors. Now, what I'm talking about here, by the way, is not site specific 20 mile an hour, where we say, let's slow down because it's a school or because it's a hospital. This is about setting 20 mile an hour for most roads in an urban environment. And what you do is set 20 mile an hour for most of them and decide where 30 mile an hour is uh, a, a safe for exceptional roads. Since then, a few things around the world. Here's me campaigning for 30 kilometers per hour in, in, in Sao Paulo. Big breakthrough came around about 2021 when uh, working with the WHO uh, in their UN Global Road Safety Week, they had a, uh, a theme of Streets for Life, Love 20, and 20 mile an hour and 30 kilometer uh, per hour limits were the key focus of that uh, uh, a week of uh, <coughs> road safety activity all around uh, the world. Bringing us right up to date, just over the last few years, Wales, uh, part of the UK, has been looking to set a default 20 mile an hour uh, urban village limit across the whole country. So again, 20 mile an hour will automatically be the speed limit wherever there is street lighting, unless the local authority makes an exception and does so on the grounds that 30 mile an hour uh, is safe, particularly for pedestrians and, and cyclists. And we now have 600 local campaigns uh, across the UK and, and beyond, a few in the US as well. And we have 28 million people living in the UK where 20 mile an hour is the default uh, uh, policy uh, for towns and villages. I said about the um, uh, UN Global Road Safety Week, uh, an important background to that was the third global ministerial conference on road safety in Stockholm in 2020. And their resolution was to mandate a maximum road travel speed of 30 kilometers per hour in areas where vulnerable road users mix with motors, unless there was strong evidence that a, uh, a higher speed uh, limit was, was safe. And that was most important because that was agreed by, I think, 130 uh, road safety ministers from around the world and really set that foundation of what is the right speed limit for wherever you have motors mixing with vulnerable road users. So we assist communities. Uh, and what we do is to help their politicians to do the right thing. And sometimes, you know, politicians need a lot of help to do the right thing. Sometimes they know what the right thing is, but you have to almost lead them by the hand to enable them uh, to do it. And what we do is empower local campaigns with information and advice. And it's really worthwhile looking at our website. We've got hundreds of pages of information and advice on 20 mile an hour uh, limits. <clears throat> and the objective is to balance that movement, safety and economy and create better streets uh, for people. It very much aligns with global best practice from the WHO and UN. 
and it's setting 20 mile an hour as a norm where people are, with exceptions, only where safe. We've only got a small team. There's myself and four others, but we really do have thousands of volunteers. And I think that's the difference with our campaign. It's very much 2020 for us, empowering all those local people to get change within their communities. And that's so important because we want behavior change in the communities of those people driving differently. And that's the key. This is not a detached, if, if you like, campaign. Uh, it involves it, us right with communities and the heart of communities. And yes, what are the objectives for communities? All will probably agree with this straight away. Yes, a reduction of road casualties by 20%. That's great. Reduce inequalities. Why should the people without cars have less mobility than the people uh, with cars? But more importantly, why should they have less safety? What about reducing emissions and noise? And how can we increase transport choice for people, whether they should be we walking, cycling, uh, 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 and bus? How do we address that first and last mile for public transport? <laughs> it's very much about changing your perspective. And we all say to people, don't judge 20 mile an hour, 30 mile an hour from behind a steering wheel. Actually, get at the sidewalk, crouch down to the height of an eight-year-old, see what it looks like from their perspective when a truck goes past at 30 miles per hour. And also try walking slowly like an 80-year-old or someone who is disabled or someone with imperfect hearing or sight. So how can we take it away from that driver-centric view and make it a people and community centric view of our roads. Places implementing 20 mile an hour uh, limits for people roads, well, 42% of UK local authorities by population. Uh, Wales has already legislated for that national 20 mile an hour default on the 17th of September. That is going to happen. Scotland to set it as the norm by 2025. Netherlands, it's a standard. France, Paris, Grenoble, most villages in France. Spain has set a national 30 kilometer per hour urban village limit a couple of years ago. And these other places are doing it as well. And not forgetting the places in USA where they're changing 25 mile an hour limits to 20 mile an hour. We like using graphics. We do a lot on social media. And these are the, some of the ways which we do that. We use our broken heart a lot not only 20 mile an hour, but focusing on the 28 million people, right, who now have 20 mile an hour limits, our 600 local campaigns. And how about some topical ones for Christmas and Valentine's Day as well? We do a lot of graphics in, in social media about how the emissions are much lower at 20 mile an hour compared with 30 mile an hour. And recently, the Transport for London issued some uh, statistics uh, on how they had some fantastic reductions uh, in casualties on uh, arterial roads, which were set at 20 mile an hour. And we put together this graphic to use ourselves and then found Transport for London were using it as well. But they're fantastic. 63% reduction in collisions involving people walking uh, um, in, uh, on those uh, roads. Here's another graphic which we use. Uh, and this is one which you can see on our website. It compares wide area 20 mile an hour plus engagement as being seven times more cost effective than speed bumps. Speed bumps work great, but the problem is they're hugely expensive. And as we say, you can treat 12 and a half thousand people in a community with a sign 20 mile an hour speed limit plus education and community feedback. And that's much better than actually just reaching 250 people while a 20 mile an hour road with speed bumps for the same cost. So there's a global case for 20 mile an hour and 30 kilometer urban default limits. And there's a key strategy, which we say for new local campaigns, build capacity. Build a team of people ready to play a long game to get your 20 mile an hour limit in your community. It will probably take two to three years. Choose your team carefully. 
make it cross party. Don't turn it into a polarized debate between left and, uh, and right. Overall, around about 80% of people say 20 mile an hour is the right speed limit for residential streets. Keep it multi-mode. Don't turn it into a cyclist versus motorist debate. It's about all of us as pedestrians, all of us as, as, as people, all of us wanting less noise from traffic, all of us enjoying our community much more. Build tangible community support. Build your team, then get that community support. Because the one thing that politicians need most is empowerment that this is popular. Do that and you'll find that they will listen to you and they then will, um, will see that this has public support. So involve schools, associations, elderly, health organizations. Change the context for thinking about speed. Make it community focused, societal. M take it out of the, if you like, the, the, the dashboard and, and put it into the street scene. Aspire to make your place a better place to be. And make the case for change based on community support. Identify though what's changed. Enable politicians to change their mind. What was right five years ago, 10 years ago, is now going to be changed because we're in a different age. We're in this third decade of the 21st century. So let's make those allowances for what our aspirations are for communities, for climate change, and everything else. And remember, 20 mile an hour is the foundation for active travel. So if you really want to transform the way those public spaces between our buildings that we call streets are shared, 20 mile an hour as a norm is deliverable in minimal time to provide a foundation for uh, road safety in this decade. It's effective in reducing speeds, it reduces casualties, and symbolically, it changes streets in favor of vulnerable road users. There are few constraints in terms of funding, engineering, skills, or materials. Just do it. It can be done. It's being done all over the world. So thank you very much for uh, listening. Please ask questions. Please look at our website. There's lots on there. Follow us on 20s Plenty uh, Frost Twitter. Email us. We do have campaigns in, in, in the US and we would, would, would like to help in any way we, we can. Connect uh, with myself on LinkedIn. And yeah, why not set up a local 20s Plenty campaign yourself? Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Uh, that was a great presentation. I, I think uh, a lot of great examples and really inspiring. Um, we, we got a lot of chats, I, I think, uh, about lowering speed limits and the value of speed bumps versus broad speed reductions. Um, we have about four minutes for questions. Um, there's, there's some good chats about my hosting skills. Um, <laughs> one of the questions was uh, about WEN's project and kind of the effect of continuous police presence and the necessity of that. Um, and could you talk a little bit more about the different interventions and, and which seem to be most effective uh, and, and what that should mean maybe in the long run? Sure. So, um... So, um, so these programs, so we didn't, we didn't evaluate the effects um, of these different components separately because they are kind of occurred during the same time period. Um, it would be impossible to separate um, the effects. Um, but that's the, that's the point of the program because we think um, the, the value of the program is that it's comprehensive. It combines um, strategies from different aspects um and um so that um that makes the the program very um effective and uh, so in terms i see a, uh, a question asking the effectiveness of the uh, speed feedback signs um so we didn't evaluate that um in our study but um speed feedback signs has been a proven uh, countermeasure to reduce speeding, like in an area immediately upstream and downstream of the speed feedback signs. Um, so that's a 
effective way to reduce speeding. Um, so, but yes, we, we think a program, a speed management program um, um, should combine these different strategies to make it more effective. Okay, so it, it kind of takes all of it to work. Okay. Um, yes. that, that, that may lead into this next question um, that I think is for Rod, where a uh, community in the United States lowered their speed limits, changed the sign, uh, but they're saying people still speed um, so what sort of street design treatments go along with 20 is plenty? Um, you kind of talked more about it being a broad citywide policy to have 20 mile per hour speed limits than specific roadway designs. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. One of the big problems which there are is with any, which you, anything which is site specific, it says slow down here and actually endorses different speeds elsewhere. So that, that's the effect when you, you, you're actually putting in, in physical calming in a, in a particular place. The campaign and, and the implementation of 20 mile an hour uh, and, and 20s plenty is very much about uh, signage, but it's not signage alone. It's a lot of community engagement. And the fact that it is community wide, it delivers it to every driver on their home street. So they get the benefit of, as well. And so uh, drivers, uh, if they get it on their streets, they're going to be much more respectful of 20 mile an hour on other streets. And you have to have that grown up debate that actually on most of the roads in our, 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 our conurbations, driving faster than 20 mile an hour between your stopping points does not decrease your journey times. Your journey times are very much dictated by how long you stopped not how fast you go when you're not stopped. So it's about having that, that grown up debate, that wide debate across the whole community, doing engagement, which is advertising, it's the, the signs on the street, it's the, uh, it's the, the communication on the, uh, on the media, it's the, it's the political process of making that decision that you're going to make their streets a better place for people to be. So it's a combination of all of those. And this is very much, very different from just putting up a sign and hoping that something happens. In the UK, what we're finding is that on faster streets uh, where the average speeds beforehand were around about 28 to 30 miles an hour, we're getting a reduction of five to six miles per hour. And the effect of this is to bring the speeds down because you've changed the reference point. It's no longer 30 miles an hour. The reference point is 20 miles an hour. And, and that is the difference. It's a societal decision to change that reference point rather than a traffic engineer deciding that that street at that point gets a 20 mile an hour limit. Yeah, I, I, I think that's gonna be a challenge for many US cities, but it's a, it's a challenge worth pursuing. Um, we are unfortunately one minute over time right now. Um, I, I want to ask a quick question to Eric, just so that everyone gets a question um, of our great panelists. Um, and that would be, it, it was great to see that kind of safely transition plan from New York City. Is that common amongst other cities, um, if you're aware? Um, actually, no, it's not common among other cities. And that's one of the things that we are trying to push out to other cities and to private fleets, which is sit down, look at your crash portfolio, look at the types of vehicles that you have and try to make changes to them in a holistic global approach. And we certainly see some movement, you know, cities like Chicago, Boston, Cambridge, others have definitely adopted side guards as a chain design to vehicles, but we wanna see a more global holistic, these are the things that we can do overall and try to get state and local governments to work together in order to, uh, if not mandate these changes, to encourage them. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely agree and hope more cities get in on that as well. Uh, again, making a plug for the Safe Fleets Challenge that America Walks is launching next month. They have a webinar um, and really excited to hear about the work done in New York City. Really excited to hear from Wen and Rod. Um, thank you all for joining us um, and thank you so much for being part of this session. Thank you.